Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Blight, I teach American history, and I'm the director of the Gilder Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition at Yale University. Um, we're delighted to be co-sponsoring this panel this afternoon uh, with the Council on Latin American and Iberian Studies uh, at the Macmillan Center at uh, Yale University. Special thanks go out to Asia Nupane, who is the uh, program director there at the Latin American Studies uh, uh, Council. And she in particular um, arranged for our Portuguese translator who is located in Portugal this afternoon. His name is Ramiro and a special thanks to Ramiro uh, for working with us on this. Uh, this is simultaneously translated in English and Portuguese. And at the very bottom of your screen, uh, if you haven't seen it already, uh, there is a globe where you just click that and pick your language. Uh, and the brilliant Romero will be translating both ways. Um, uh, I'm gonna quickly introduce our moderator for this program, but I also wanna mention that our three speakers who Stuart Schwartz will introduce a little more formally. Arjunia Fiera Furtado, who's here at the Macmillan Center on a Fulbright uh, Fellowship, a uh, major scholar from uh, the University of Minas Gerais in uh, Brazil. Uh, Dorian Meyer, who is uh, the, uh, currently our GLC Fellow in Modern Slavery. Uh, we're sharing her with the Architecture School here at, at Yale. Um, and uh, Zhao Reese, who is here for a full semester fellowship. The great Zhao is here, back here again. We've had Zhao here before for conferences, um, and we've been thrilled to have him here this semester. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Stuart Schwartz. Now, everybody in this field, uh, our friends in Brazil, for sure, and uh, here in the US and North America, no Stewart in this field. He's uh, one of the most distinguished members of the Yale History Department, and certainly one of the greatest scholars of slavery and abolition uh, in Brazil and Latin America. He's written some 21 books. Uh, that's an up-to-date count I got from Stewart, not my count. Uh, they include such terrific books as All Can Be Saved, Religion, uh, Religious Toleration in the Iberian Atlantic World, Sugar Plantations and the Formation of Brazilian Society, Sovereignty and Society in Colonial Brazil. And he is now a, a major historian of hurricanes. So don't miss his book called Sea of Storms. And he's often now a commentator on hurricanes, which of course are a constant problem now in, in the Caribbean and in North America. Um, anyway, we're delighted to, to sponsor this a panel on perspectives on slavery and freedom in Brazil at the GLC here some eight or nine years ago. Stuart Schwartz helped me and our team uh, plan and produce a major conference on this subject. That's probably even 10 years ago now. And it's high time, at least in a somewhat smaller way, we revisit uh, and readdress this question. So uh, without further ado, oh, I wanna mention one other thing, I'm sorry. Um, the GLC's uh, annual conference, our major conference is next week. Uh, most of you know that if you're on our newsletter, if you're not, sign up. It's on the topic of teaching race and slavery in the American classroom. And we've got a stellar group of scholars and historians, but also we are showcasing teachers themselves from all over the United States who are now facing this question, this wedge issue in our political lives of how to teach about these matters in classrooms. So without further ado, I wanna hand it off to my colleague, Stuart Schwartz, who will moderate the entire panel, which will be in Portuguese, translated into English and the other way around. Stuart, over to you, and thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good, good afternoon, everyone. I have a pleasure to receive here as a moderator of this meeting sponsored by the 
Gilder Lambert Center in collaboration with the Macmillan Center and the Council of Latin American and Iberian Studies from Yale University. We have today three distinguished speakers who represent one of the most interesting and innovative approaches for one of the big topics in Brazilian history, the history of slavery. And I am lucky to have in this semester these three speakers at the campus, Junia Ferreira Furtado, professor of early modern history at the Federal University of Minas Gerais and the Federal University of Sao Paulo. And our Fulbright Distinguished Scholar at Yale this semester. She's the author of several books about the social history of Brazil, colonial, and the cartographic history of Brazil. We also have João José Reis, professor at the Federal University of Bahia in Salvador and visiting professor at the Gilder Lerman Center in this semester. He received his PhD by the University of Minnesota where he uh, unfortunately was my um, PhD student. He, he had the unfortunate chance and he has published about the history of slavery in Brazil, especially in the 19th century. And we have Dorian Meyer who got his education in Brazil and then got her PhD in architecture in the University of Kansas. She is an architect and urban planner and she's here in Yale as a postdoctoral associate at the Gilder Lerman Center. She is interested in the influence of slavery on the built environment and its passage in Brazil. And they will give their talks in chronological orders. So we will start with Junia, followed by João and then Doriani. Then we'll open for a Q&A session. So I now start the session with Junia Furtado, Black Pearls in Little Africa, Black Women, in Tijuco in the 18th century. Junia, you have the microphone. Uh, thank you very much, much for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen with a PowerPoint. This study that I've been developing, if you're not used with, if you don't know the situation, the region, this is the state of Minas Gerais and the region of Giamanchina district is there in the northeast of the region. It, it didn't have the the it didn't have the borders that it has today. My topic is related to the Giamanchino district the Ahayao of Tejuku, which was the headquarters of this district, Diamond District, that was created in 1736 as a, an administri administrative unit independent from the municipality. And it's the place where Chica da Silva lived. And from that, I investigated not only the slaves, but also the women and I found the census of 1774, which is a map of inhabitants of the Diamond District by street. So as you can see, the, uh, the right street is the first in the Ahayao, is the more central one. And the houses are listed with the head the, of the house, the color, if it's black or Creole, which is a son of Africans. Uh, if it's black, then it's African in origin. If it's Pardo, and also the free people that live in that house. So it's a census that doesn't cover slavery as with one exception, which are two 
slaves that share a house, a rented house, showing exactly that Quartação is a halfway between slavery and freedom. Those were individuals that were in this process of uh, purchasing their, their freedom. So this census had followed this map. It's a map where the houses are drawn and in darker color, you see the center of the Ahayao and in lighter shades, the periphery. But what drew my attention in this census is this proximity between white men, which are 38.6% of inhabitants, and black women or women of color, including Creole, Black, Parda, and Cabra, which are the ones that have some mixing with uh, Indians. But in this sense, adding up with uh, men of color, 54%, almost 55% of uh, heads of houses in this Ahayal are of color with a predominance of women, 37.7%. That's what I call a, a small or little Africa, a place where travelers in the 19th century will describe as a place that is elitist, rich. Saint-Hilaire says that it's the only place where he spoke French when he stayed there. So, but it was an Ahayao marked by this presence and uh, African presence as a as I show here because African women they are 111 so 56.1 percent of women and if you add that with uh, Creole which are Africans uh, descendant of Africans but born in Brazil we have here more than 70 percent of those women not only of color, but uh, dark black color. So I brought this here for us to see. Carlos Julião is a military engineer that went through the village of Tijuco. And he, he made several images of these women that I think are very interesting because they are similar to those image of castes that we don't have a lot in the Portuguese empire, but that shows the elegance and how they were distinguished. So you can see here the African black women with hats and scarves and coats, shoes with uh, belts, socks, the Creoles uh, a little bit lighter with lighter skin, but also well-dressed, the mulatto women mixing uh, jewelry and things, adornishments related to Catholic and African religions, the Arda women, and the image that I use in my book to open the book of Chica da Silva is a Arda women from this region showing one of the forms of uh, ascension of these women, which was a seduction of white men. But differently from Chica da Silva, what I could observe is that we cannot say that the majority of those women uh, ascended socially through relationship with white men. So this is a a table of concubinage crimes that I found for Tijuku. So around 50 women, we could say only 39 are freed, 15 remain slaves. So this is a mechanism of access to freedom, but it's not the only one. I will call our attention to some interesting things in this table. I won't show the whole table. I'm already reaching the end, but we can see that, for example, when we look at men of color, they, 56 of them, 
have a profession, while women only two are related to a profession. One owns a or has a ranch, and the other a Uh, this is adding all the women to of men of color, but who are not also women of color, but not heads of houses. So for this total of 228 women, we have a majority of 99% who do not work. So they live of slavery. And one of the big issues that I'm studying is how they reached how they achieved freedom because the men clearly they achieve freedom through work through these crafts that they that they do in the free world so another aspect that i want to call your attention that is here is how these women are most of them are alone 71 percent they live alone different from white men that only two percent while men of color have a more a behavior that is more similar only 9.1 percent are alone in their houses but there's a large number of uh, children and then there's the issue of illegitimacy. So in studying this census, I've been trying to work on what I call a geography of slavery. I think there's another one. So if we look, the people that have companions in the household, 42 of 88 have companions, they live with other people. The women of color live alone majority only 14 percent have companions and white men have a similar behavior to black men and this is the final table so if we look at white women they are more i mean women of color they are their companions are mostly uh, sisters brothers mothers and also friends comrades and in all cases the largest number of people in the household are family members but it's very interesting that women they have this presence of friends companions they call companions while white men They have companions, but usually are employees or officials that are at, the, at their service. And in the case of men of color, they're usually officials that perform the same work. So in the house of a iron worker, where there are others. So I've been trying to work to what I'm on what I'm calling a geography of this little Africa, which is a geography that is, it's a division in race and sex, gender, that is very significant. But what is interesting is that those women, they are spread across the village. I call this a geography of the streets of this village, where there's some fluidity in this geography because people of all colors, they are mixed in this, houses even though women of color clearly they have a largest presence in the the periphery than at the center while white men they have a strong presence in the places of power the intendant's house the close to the church and so on i've been calling saying that there is a geography of uh, blocks where people as the street moves away towards the periphery 
the, uh, there's a largest number of people of color that live there in the periphery. But I've been drawing attention to the silences of this geography. For example, I was able to identify some prostitutes that, of course, they're not listed as prostitutes. I was able to identify uh, couples that live in different houses, what Luciano Figueiredo called uh, fractured family or divided family. So there's this, the presence of this significant number of illegitimate sons or children. So if you look here, this first number, the majority of people who, the companions that live in their household are uh, descendants. But if we look, this number here, this largest number of descendants are here on under white men that have 121 uh, children in these houses. Those are larger families, while men of color and women of color, they have more difficulty and the mortality rates of those children. And especially when they reach the house, when they are freed, they are not uh, in fertile age anymore. So that's what probably explained this small number of children, but this doesn't mean that they haven't had children in another, another moment. And I even found one whose daughter remained a slave. And even though she had already acquired for herself uh, a slave. So one of the big silences of this document that I've been working on, and I need to seek other documents and look at other places to to seek information is slavery because the only slaves that appear are two slaves that are in the process of uh, gaining their freedom and that live together in one of those houses, these rented houses. There's a geography there also of houses that are rented and houses that are um, owned. The majority of women and people of color live in rented houses. So this shows exactly that they uh, left slavery, they were, they entered this world of freedom, but they still have faced lots of difficulties to accumulate um, wealth and to affirm socially in this society. So uh, later we can discuss more during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Junia. Now we are going to pass the microphone to João Reis, who will give his presentation, which is a biography of an enslaved African that became uh, an African slaver. So João with you. Thank you, Stuart. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I would like to greet everyone uh, the way that we should greet everyone nowadays. I will then do uh, share the screen. Can you see my screen there? And now just so you can follow me. Now I will start my time, 15 minutes. Okay. This is the story of an African man that was born in 1775 and died in 1865 in Salvador. He was Hausa, so he lived his land of origin is the north of Nigeria today, the Hausa country, and he was captured during the Holy Wars 
in his country, the Jihad of 1804 that resulted in the formation of the Caliphate of Sokoto under the Fulani. So he was sold at the coast to uh, traffickers from Bahia and reached Bahia in 1806. The owner of the boat that brought him uh, kept him and others that came in this boat, uh, kept them as slaves. I'm sorry, I was interrupted here for me to say that I was, to say to me that what was on the screen is the image of my, my notes. But uh, that's what I want you to see. It's just for you to understand better. So Stuart, you can add two minutes to my talk. So what's impressive in the case of this man is that when he dies in 1865, he was the owner of 28 people, enslaved people in, of four houses in Salvador and land in the periphery, the outskirts. So in total, 40,000 hays, and that placed him among the 10% the 10 wealthiest people in the city based on the wealth present in the post-mortem inventory. This wealth started to be formed when he was still a slave. When he was freed in 1841, after the death of his uh, slave owner, he already owned five people under his domain. So even though he was, of course, he was a person, exceptional person, because uh, we don't have statistics, but certainly more than 90% of those people that came from Africa being trafficked, trafficked or that were born in Brazil under slavery, they were, they died as slaves. So he certainly was an exceptional person in the city. This numbers that I just said, which is an est estimate, actually, it's not, it's not an exact data, but in the city, this number was much lower precisely because of the cities, there was a larger possibility of access to an economy that allowed the enslaved people to purchase their freedom. And it's a very well-known thing. And Brazil was exceptional in the sense that in the slave slavery society, it produced a large number of former slaves that were freed and their descendants. So when we reach the middle of the 19th century, the large share of the population that was called of color in Brazil, they were not uh, slaves anymore for a few decades. So even though he was exceptional, we would say, oh, but why to study a person like this? This is the type of question that nobody asks when we are studying a white man, right? Why to study? Why to study the white? So it's important to study individual stories. And this has a political relevance in the sense that the Africans that were brought to Brazil, they uh, stop to belong to this mass, anonymous mass of enslaved people, and they become an individual, identifiable one, and not only a, a spark in documents, but actually through a path that is much wider, like in this case, a, a path of almost, almost 60 years in Brazil after he reaches here. We don't know anything about his life before in Africa. So it's very important, this type of study. Naturally, 
it's a study that will not will not reveal to us that uh, this biography in detail, but these uh, successful people, it's possible to write about them, lots of things exactly because they are successful and thus they left uh, marks uh, in documentation, uh, starting with their baptism records and, and other baptisms where they appeared as godfathers and godmothers and when they died they left a uh, state and many times there were um, struggles in the judiciary for the state or maybe because of a crime that they committed or these people could accuse, accuse others of committing crime so there's a vast possibility of finding documentation about these people but especially in that which is recorded in books of of uh, notaries which is the purchase and sale of property even of uh, enslaved people but naturally of houses and property in general lands and so on so even though he was an exceptional person we can ask a few questions about how this person could explain to us something about the move, movement of uh, freed people, those enslaved people who in some way uh, got their freedom. One of the more general questions is what are the circumstances that uh, allowed social mobility would be a, a dynamic of urban uh, labor market was the African origin of successful people. Uh, this is an important thing that I intend to explore because, for example, he came from a very commercial society, the Hausa society. The type of slavery experienced by Africans in this uh, path to ascension also seems important the owner of Manuel Joaquin Ricardo, who was called Manuel José Ricardo, gave him the opportunity to him and other slaves to invest in commerce and to keep part of the fruits of their labor. And what are the barriers and the breaches, political and social and cultural, that allowed or, or prevented the ascension of slaves in Bahia. So a biography like this one can allow us to answer or problematize some of those questions. So it follows what would be a scheme of chapters of the book, an introduction discussing microbiographies, African microbiographies, which is a growing field. And there's a center in Bahia dedicated to this study, a chapter about the white um, man that had books navigating to Europe and Africa. Then there's a chapter about Manuel Ricardo, his African background and his experience in slavery and freedom in Bahia, a chapter specifically about the enslaved people of Manu Manuel Ricardo from the period where he was still uh, an enslaved person. And then I discuss in depth, maybe that was not discussed yet in urban slavery history about the issue of the slave owners that were still slaves. I found more than 500 cases of those in the first half of the 19th century in Bahia. Then the diversification of investments, the sale of food, purchase and rent, rental of houses and land, loans, and finally his social network, the family, friends, business partners. I have a fantastic documentation about this. And I already start to accumulate a documentation, fantastic, about his descendants. 
I will try now to raise, to assess. Can you see this? This is his genealogical tree of the family Ricardo Conceição, his wife. Unfortunately, I didn't get, couldn't find a lot of information about his wife. Can you see the family tree? No, we cannot see. Now, yes. All right. So you can see in this genealogical tree that I've reached the third generation. And it's very interesting because there is a movement of social ascension that is done through women. Uh, not one of the sons, the three sons that are alive when Manuel Ricardo died, not one of those left descendants, only his daughter that married with a, a teacher, famous teacher in Brazil, also a black man born in Brazil, that probably met his wife when he was uh, teaching the boys and maybe even her to learn how to read and write. So it's an important thing because Manuel, Joaquin, or his wife, they, they didn't know how to write Portuguese. He used business partners, friends, and later his sons and his in-law to write documents. So this couple, the daughter of Manuel Joaquin and the teacher, they have several children also. And of those, I could only identify two surviving children at the time when the professor dies. The teacher dies in 1896. So the granddaughter of Manuel Joaquin marries a person who is also a black person born in Brazil, who is Sabino José dos Santos Jr., a son of a militant a craftsman that participated in an organization of self-help, but that disputed elections, even, even national, national elections. He was even indicated to be elected for the class, he was called Sabino José dos Santos. We are talking about his son who studied law in the school of law of Recife. This is another issue to be investigated. If he was a person, uh, a lone person, a black man in Recife, he was the only one of there was or if there were others. So in there's evidence that he became a militant for abolitionism. So the founder of this family who is an enslaver, let's say, well succeeded. Uh, he had 28 slaves when he died. He, I was able to reach an abolitionist. So an African starts this family and at the end, uh, there's a Creole who defends the abolition. And so it's very interesting because the daughter of the teacher inherits a school that will be headed by her husband, Sabino José dos Santos. And this school, it's another irony of history uh, functioned at the house of Castro Alves. And right now I received here the message from my own cell phone saying that my time is up. So uh, we can discuss later in the Q&A if there's time. So thank you. And now let's continue to this series of talks. Thank you, João.
Thank you, João. Let's now see. Let's now have the talk of Doriani Meyer about who will talk about uh, transfers of power and red resistance. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you and share this space with João and Julia. João, I think you need to stop sharing the screen. can see it, Doriani? Yes. So I will start with an image, which is well known of Brazilians. It's a picture that was circulated a few years ago. We see a, a white couple walking with their dog and uh, behind their children who are pushed on a stroll by the black nanny. And so this shows the inequality in Brazil and inheritance of slavery. But the focus of my study is the influence of the built environment in supporting this inequality. So we're going back to the beginning of colonization of Brazil. So in the 16th, century, I'll do a brief summary, the Portuguese started building several sugarcane farms and the Reconcavo of Bahia, if you don't know, it's located in the northeast of Brazil, where is the city of Salvador, which was the first capital of the colony. So for the region of Reconcavo, 30% of the 4 million slaves uh, that reached Brazil were brought. And Bahia alone received three times more slaves than the United States. The majority of those slaves that arrived were, were brought to Bahia. They were brought to work on the sugarcane plantations. So geography of these farms and the way that its buildings were located were essential to control those slaves. Uh, however, in the same way that the space was used to control them, the enslaved workers also used the spaces of the farms to resist this system. This is a Cajaiba sugarcane plantation where we can see the Casa Grande and the sugar factory. The engine was built in an island, so this shows the difficulty for the slaves because they control was higher. And if you look from top, we see that the buildings were built inside a quadrant where the slaves quarters, the senzala and the sugar mill, they could be watched from the big house and the overseer's house. And these four buildings were the main buildings in this plantations, which were the big house, the sugar mill and the overseer's house. This picture on the left shows the dining room of the Cajaiba plantation where we can see the mirrors and the mirrors were located in a way that the owner of the house through the mirrors, he could have an external view of the house. So he could control the outside space even during meals. And the picture on the right shows the sugar mill from one of the windows of the big house, we could see the sugar mill and the overseer's house. This, these two pictures show elements of control, now physical control of slaves. The right side, we can see the chains attached to a, a tree, which was in front of the house where from the window, the 
owner could see the slaves being chastised and this uh, well is in front of the sugar mill and you can see there in the picture, but at the bottom of the well, there are, um, there are uh, lances and, and sometimes the slaves who disobeyed were thrown there to die and sometimes they didn't die when they fall in, they just would die when the river level came up. So, however, the vigilance was simultaneous. The same way that they were vigilated, they could also uh, observe the routine of the family and the overseers. So, these two pictures on the left, you see a view from of the big house when the slaves were in the mill, and the archival picture is an old picture of the view from the slaves' quarters. And if we look at this bottom part, we can see the internal part where the domestic slaves were. They were locked in those doors. So an example of how this worked is that there was a neighboring plantation belonging to the same owner and the slaves could control the routine and observe the routine of the owner. And he was a, the son of the owner of Kajaiba plantation and the slaves uh, went there and killed him because they could follow his routine and he, so they were able to enter the house and kill him. So this shows how the slaves had a visual control of this space. This is another plantation, the Freguesia, located close to Salvador. It's one of the oldest plantations in, in Reconcovo. It's from the 16th century, and this shows the big house with four stories and the chapel. This plantation exists until today. It's a museum now and it has just been renovated. According to the descriptions of travelers that went there by boat, we can see here an aerial view of the plantation. It's uh, from Google map before the renovation. So like three years ago, we can see that in addition to the mill and the big house, I located here the spaces of the overseer's house and here, and there are some small buildings where the travelers, some travelers reported that there were small buildings like a village that probably were houses for uh, carpentry and ironworks. So it was a large, this was a large plantation with lots of people. But in the same way that there was visual control of the big house and the overseer's house, as we saw in Cajaiba, it also existed here. And in the same way, the slaves from their quarters, they could see the overseers in the big house. And behind the house, you can see here, this is a hill. So the slaves could uh, climb the hill at night to talk and, and even plan uh, bargains or escapes, some daily resistance that they did. Another mode of resistance and use of the space by enslaved people was called uh, the peasant's breach, Brescia Camponesa. So the uh, owners, they allowed some land for the slaves to plant. And so they had the objective of keeping them there trapped, but also they could cultivate their own food. But for the slaves, it was one way of appropriating the use of the land and they could sell that, that product to the owner or gain permission to sell in nearby zones. So with this money, many times they save this money to buy their freedom. That would depend, of course, in the owner of each plantation. So both in Cajaiba and Freguesia, there are testimonies that both plantations had this small um, peasant's breach, this small 
plantation. So escape was the more permanent way of resistance. Many enslaved people would would escape, and sometimes uh, far, or sometimes they lived in hills close to the plantation, and they came back at night to see their family or friends that were left behind. But in the case of Freguesia plantation, there's an island in front, Ilha the Mare Island, and the slaves would escape swimming to this island. Many would die, uh, drown, because it, there's strong currents. But those who arrived there, they built a community, a Quilombola community that is, exists until today. They are descendants of slaves from Freguesia and other plantations in the region. Here we can see on the left side, and this is the Freguesia plantation. I took this picture from the sugar mill ruins, and we can see the Mare Island there. It's not very far, but there are strong currents. Now, I will move away from the historical research and co go back to the present, where I compare with the current situation of big cities. So we are coming back to the 21st century, to current Brazil. This is the city of Sao Paulo. In the picture, we see the financial center, the financial center of the country. And if it, the data didn't change, Sao Paulo is the 21st uh, more wealthy city in the world. But the question is how a city with all this luxury and this wealth can have neighborhoods like this one and have a misery like this favela. Two million people live in favelas in one of the richest cities in the world. And the majority of people of high and middle class, they pretend to not see this uh, behind their walls and their tall buildings. And man, many don't know this misery or don't care. So we find favelas all over Brazil. If you know Brazil, you know that Almost all cities have favelas. Some are larger, other smaller, but some have more infrastructure. Others are, have, are completely socially isolated, but the majority usually is isolated in a way uh, or a mall or a park like this one. I, on top, you see the, where the middle class and high class lives and here's the favela. This is in Salvador, as with 3 million inhabitants and 33% live in favelas. And this is another favela in Salvador without any infrastructure, not even a sewer. So favelas are communities usually built by um, invading land because they don't have where to live. And they started soon after the abolition of slavery where the slaves did not receive any support from the government and they started to occupy empty lands around cities and in the hills. This image shows Rio de Janeiro in the beginning of the 20th century. In the top, we see that the city was building with urban was growing with urban planning while the favelas were formed uh, disorganized without any support from the government. Here we see a current image of Rio de Janeiro where we see the Leblon neighborhood, uh, a high class neighborhood is the most expensive land in Rio. And next to it, we see the favela of Vigical and behind we see Rocinha, which is the largest favela in Brazil. Rocinha has around 70 million inhabitants and it's like a city, 70,000, it's like a city in Rio de Janeiro. And Rocinha, like many favelas in Brazil, have their own infrastructure created through decades by their inhabitants because the government doesn't give any support. So it's the daily struggle without any support from the government. But even though it's a community with a neighborhood infrastructure, it shows the ethnical difference that exists between high class and low class neighborhoods in Brazil. The majority of the people in, in Rocinha are Afro descendants. And I'll show here the ethnicity of rich areas in the city, the richest areas in Lemblo and Ipanema, Copacabana, and uh, the Lagoon, Lagoa, one of the also most expensive regions in Rio. Here you see the ethnicity in colors. 
83% are white, 13% pardo or mixed, and 4% black. We see small regions, small focus of red due to the small favelas that exist behind these neighborhoods. And small black dots that we see here are usually um, domestic workers that live in the houses of their buses. So one of the things that exists in Rio de Janeiro is that the bus lines that go through the main favelas in Rio do not communicate with this zone, the south zone, because they don't want people from favela to go to the beaches that are intended for middle and high class and white people. So how the inhabitants of the favelas, they try to live through creative ideas like this gentleman who sells uh, furniture for gardens that are built, made with material that he collects from trash. He creates these uh, tables with bicycle wheels and he uses mason jars. This is a way that the favelas have to preserve their history. It is in Mare Favela. It's a way that they have is a resistance to systemic racism because they are apart from society. In this example, the Maria Favela built a small library and they host events and they even did a reconstruction of the favela, a model to be able to study how to do improvements. So the inhabitants do this with minimum support from the government. But despite of all this daily struggle for space in society, we see clear differences in the urban environments, built environments. And, and even though there is a built environment in, in rich and poor areas, they are completely different and maintenance also is different. So here we see a picture of two parks. I think this is in Sao Paulo, the Ibirapuera Park. We see white children. We see here the legs, I don't know if you see here, the legs of a black woman, but by her white clothes, she's probably a nanny taking care of uh, white children. So it's, there's equipment, it's a beautiful park, and this is the poor area of the city where there's not even grass and there's the children playing with a tire. Uh, as a swing. So if there's social inequality everywhere, this is an example of a wall. This is in Rio de Janeiro. This wall, when we leave the airport, international airport of Rio, that the government built this wall during the Olympics because they didn't want tourists when they arrived in Rio to see the favela behind, which is the Maré favela. It's a way that society has to pretend that this poverty does not exist. And if you look at this building under construction, we see the majority of the workers are black and civil construction is the area that most employs black men in Brazil, while 6 million Afro-Brazilian women work as domestic employees, um, cleaning, washing, cooking, and taking care of the children of their bosses that are usually white. In the same way, that the grandmothers did, their grand grandmothers did during slavery. And this architecture also supports the social inequality because in the same way that their um, great grand mothers lived in slave quarters, the maids today live in the back rooms. This is a 20th century house where the maid's house was uh, next to the chicken coop. And this to show that things haven't changed. We see two examples here. One uh, building built in 1943 in Sao Paulo in the beginning of verticalization of the city. And here, this building in Salvador built in 2019. The architecture is the same. The apartments are divided in private areas, social areas, and the service area. And the maid's room are at the back. This they have the same architecture, these two apartments and the doors of entrance to the apartment. The family enters through the social door and the employee, the, the maid enters through the service door. And it shows clearly that the 
elevators are separated. It, uh, currently in Brazil, it, this is forbidden by law, I, I think since the 80s, but many buildings still have separated elevators and they pretend to obey the law, but even though when the elevators are together, the maids are um, not expected to take these elevators. And I would like to say that for many Brazilians, the situation can be even worse because currently there are more than 369,000 Brazilians living as slaves, working in farms, in mines, in factories, and even children. And of course, most of those are black. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Doriani. We uh, now have uh, time for uh, some uh, some questions. Agora temos tempo para algumas Now we have time for questions. So let's start with Peter Haskin. He has a question to Junia about the nature of the document that you have. It seems that it's a document an Episcopal document, but he would like to know more about the nature of these census that you handled. Thank you, Peter, for the question. No, it's not an Episcopal document. Actually, in the beginning of 1774, the Portuguese government, they ordered uh, census to be done in all the Portuguese empire. And we have very few that survived until today. And this is one of those. It seems that Sabará was also done. There are a few that still exist. So it's a, it's a census, a civil census done in the region of diamonds. It's a separate from the Capitania, it formed the Diamond District, and it's the intendant that will do this assessment. It's a, a very interesting document that I've been working on, and there are several possibilities of working on it. It, it doesn't include the slaves. It's a census only of the free inhabitants of the village, but uh, working with some um, uh, estate documents, uh, wills and other religious documents, I've been able to identify some of those inhabitants and to discover some relations that we cannot see just in this document at first. Thank you, Junia. We also have a question of from Adrienne Van Dyke about the situation in Brazil and, and slavery. There were many slaves purchasing their freedom and many slaves living separate from their owners, many houses uh, headed by women. She wanted to know if all that it suggests that slavery was different in Brazil from the United States, that maybe it was a society 
more vibrant and maybe happier with uh, more freedom of conscience and expression than in the United States? It's a, a question maybe to Junia and João. Well, I would say that there was, yes, a possibility of, of passage in larger quantity of slaves to the world of the free in Brazil, more in Brazil than the United States. And Minas Gerais is a, the state is privileged in this sense because we have their census in the second half of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th that show that really it was on one of the society's largest uh, slave societies uh, in the Americas, but also of freed people. But now happiness is a thing, it's harder to, to tell. It's of course that I say that no human life is completely unhappy and no, and also no human life is completely happy. So the concept of happiness, uh, I think it's not the best one for us to discuss, but that there was some fluidity, yes, but there, was, there, were, there were always limits. The, the freed people, they were free. They had a social status that even when they acquired some some property like this slave that João showed and Chica da Silva herself, and they end up having slaves and, and property, but they also always are freed people. They cannot uh, climb and uh, achieve some positions. They can't, there are several restrictions uh, depending on the type of taxing, for example, in Minas Gerais, the first half of the 18th century, the freed people paid tax on themselves because they still, there was still some remains of slavery. So it's an environment that is more fluid, more heterogeneous. And I think that the, the Diamond District is attracting me a lot because I show there, there's a significant presence of uh, African women. And I'm trying to answer this question, how they were able to get their freedom, uh, several mechanisms that were available. But we must remember that the system of quartação was also a system to accommodate the slave because different from what Doriana showed, it's more difficult to control slaves in urban space. And it's more difficult to control slaves in mining. So we need to have mechanisms to, for the slave to accept in a way that is less repressive without, not that there wasn't a repression, but uh, together with rep repression, there were mechanisms through which the slave was or perceived that in some time in the future he could become free. So the chance of going back to Africa was um, minimal. Even their place of origin, I mean, it was very different. There wasn't an Africa, there wasn't a Africa organized in, in countries like today. So they had to find their lives on the other side of the Atlantic. And so they used the breaches in the system. But uh, then to say that there was uh, general happiness, I would be more careful, even though that, of course, there are individual free, uh, happiness in moments of life that we cannot deny. Of course, they were not uh, unhappy all the time. They're at the level of individual, but at the society level, I don't think that it was a situation of happiness. Thank you, Junia. We have two questions for João. One is from Bruno Veras, another from Eduardo Freire. João, Bruno would like to, Bruno would like to know 
if you know something about religion of Manuel Ricardo. And a second question, from what port in Africa he came? And if this information could indicate where they came in Nigeria and the houseland. And Eduarda wants to know if it was difficult Uh, given the nature of slaves as, as merchandise, if it was difficult to find documents about their origins. So I'll answer in the order that the questions were asked about the religion of Manuel Ricardo. Naturally, I know very well that he came from an area that was predominantly uh, Islamic, but or, but not with one type of Islam that you had was started by a group, more orthodox group, to um, submit other group of Muslims who they believed that were not faithful to the correct doctrine. And in addition, there was also a population that adopted other religious manifestation, especially Bori, which is like a candomblé from Hausa. But I could not find any evidence very clear about Manuel Ricardo embracing Islam. It is present, he's present in all these Catholic rit rituals as a godfather, he gets married in the church, and he has a devotion to saints that he declares when he writes his uh, will. But there's nothing about Islam. No. Uh, nothing in the things that he wrote or dictated that showed. And he also has, is related with uh, Candomblé people. He had a partnership with a business partnership with an exiled, a former slave, African slave that returned to Africa, that was uh, a priest of Shango. He had relations with his wife that was Ilea Nassau, the famous who founded the Candomblé of the White House, one of the most famous in Bahia. So he had lots of people and friendship and relations with people of Candomblé, but I could not find anything. Well, actually there's one evidence interesting that he would have even a Candomblé house, but it seems that it's uh, not real. According to his origins, well, he was Hausa, but Bruno certainly wants to know where he came, but he was a victim of the first moments of Jihad. Jihad starts in 1804 and he reaches Bahia between 1806 and 07. So he was, let's say in the first wave, he went in the first wave of those that were victims of jihad. He could be a warrior, but he could also be someone who was in the middle of the war. I mean, he could have been captured in a fair where he was selling his, his things or at home or working in the field or in caravans. So it's, uh, knowing where the port where he embarked the ship will not help us to specify where he came in the Hausa country, but probably he uh, was always in, also maybe in Aljuda or Onin, the ancient port of Lagos. The other question was what exactly, Stuart? The second person 
it's about the documents that you used to establish the genealogy. Yes, well, I could spend the whole evening talking about that because, because it's a large collection of documents. I only mentioned a few that are related with, the, with ownership, with property, and his presence in Catholic rituals like marriage, baptisms, death, will, because wills also have their um, requests that a, a Catholic also always asks something to save their souls. So there are many documents, uh, newspapers, not so much for Manuel Ricardo, but for his descendants, I used uh, newspapers where I discovered the activities of his son-in-law the and then the husband of his granddaughter, um, uh, internet research. I entered, I visited through the internet uh, an archive of the School of Law of Recife. I wrote to them, the person answered in less than five hours, they already answered my questions, which uh, were, uh, the parents of the lawyer, abolitionist lawyer, the date of birth. Uh, this research we do by following uh, tips. You find one thing that takes you to another thing and so on. And the documents are uh, there's a lot of variety of documents. I cannot describe all those. Thank you, João. Uh, Winston is asking a question to all participants. He would like to know if the term black slaves is more appropriate than African or enslaved Africans. Is this terminology, which is more correct? And why are these colonial terms still being used? Uh, this is a question for all participants. I will start because it's uh, something that concerns us. It concerns us if the use of terms that are part of language and even the language of militants, but also the academy of today and using those terms for the past, because in the case of Bahia, not only in the case of Bahia, but in Brazil, when the colony, when they said black, it meant born in Africa. And when they said Creole, it meant the black uh, persons that were born in Brazil. When they said Pardo, it, it meant a mixed black and white. When they said Cabra, it was a mixed between black and Indian. So these categories they have a lot of importance and if you want to understand the past you need to use the native categories those that exist in the past and those that were used by the people to identify themselves and even to form communities based on those identities racial and ethnic ethnic and without that you won't understand the past you only project the present to the past that and it doesn't make any sense to understand what took place. João, you think that enslaved Africans is more correct? More correct than what? More correct than uh, black slave. Well, enslaved African is the person born in Brazil that, no, I'm sorry, the person born in Africa that was enslaved. So it's related to one identity, a very specific identity. When you say black, it's, it's an abstraction for that period because it could be someone born in Brazil, someone born in Africa. So it's better to work with a more specific terminology. Yes, I follow the same line as Joel, because in this case of, of all the documentation they, that I'm working on and this specific 
study with the, this map of inhabitants, the census, the census assigns categories that are very clear. So black is the African, uh, Creole or Creole is the uh, children of Africans or someone but born in Brazil. Uh, pardo, uh, they don't use the word mulatto, they usually use the word pardo. It's this mixed race. There are some documents where mulatto appears, but not in the census. census. The word used is pardo, and there's cabra. I'm in favor of us. I think that it's a discussion that I, I'm a dissertation advisor, and the guy, he insisting to use, instead of slave, he prefers to use people in condition of slavery. And so the, his whole thesis, instead of saying one word, it's three people in condition of slavery. I don't, I think that we must use the word that they used. The word is slave. It, they didn't say people in condition of slaves of slavery. Uh, so the documentation and what you find, the word that you find is slave. I think that we must use the word of that time so that we, we can understand about, about who they're talking about. And another important thing in historiography of slavery is exactly to understand this reconstruction of Africa and Brazil, the new relationships that are established, the culture that emerges in this, uh, between the original culture of slavery with, not slavery, the or original African culture with the, in the case of João, who works with uh, rebellions, these uh, differences are very important because there are rebellions where the Africans uh, refuse to participate, to, to have Creoles participating or the opposite, Creoles refuse to participate. So there are internal differences and separations that we must use the words. I, I have used a lot in my studies, uh, dictionary of the 18th and 19th century. I worked now in an article that is coming out in the Revista, in the journal Manguinho. And one of the important sources for me are the dictionaries because those words, the word uh, continues or remains, but the meaning changes. So I think we must use the word with the meaning that it had at that time and explain, explain this meaning. I, Doriani, you you used the word slaves and there are lots of enslaved people in brazil now even children so i want to know your interpretation of the word the use of the word in this sense yes i think that people from architecture when i go to conferences on architecture the architects continue to use the word slaves instead of enslaved people. But more here, I think, than in Brazil. I use in my work, my research, I, like João said, I say enslaved Africans are when they come from Africa. And I usually say enslaved people when I say in general, uh, people born or in, in Brazil. Or, but there's a term that bothers me when I talk about Brazil, which is Afro-descendant. I don't like this term. People use this term only for black people. And we are all Afro-descendants. My, my grand-grandmother was black. So people are using this only for people who have black skin and I disagree, but in general, I use enslaved people or enslaved workers. And in modern slavery, we people are saying more slave than enslaved. But I think the right would be enslaved, but I, I hear both, both terms nowadays. I'll take some time to say that I've been seeing in documents 
references to uh, mestizo from Goa or the Pardo from Goa. So it's a way of identifying. So I think that in our studies about race, identity in the Portuguese empire, we must take into account also what was happening in Asia, which is a, a kind of a fake separation, separating the Atlantic world from the Indian world in, for the understanding of the nature and operation of the racial system that existed both in the, uh, in the Portuguese empire and even later. So we're reaching the end at 6 p.m. And so I'd like to thank you for your contributions and the support of the audience. And I would like to thank for the opportunity of being with you here. Obrigado. Great session, everybody. Thanks so much. Obrigado. Obrigado. Thank Have you. Have a great evening. Thanks.